The late afternoon sun was low, casting long shadows across my office. I was at my desk where architectural blueprints were spread out, showing every line and curve of the downtown cultural center project. I ran my fingers over the plans, checking measurements, envisioning what it would look like when it was finally completed. This project was set to be my firm's crowning achievement. Assuming, of course, my business partner, Rick, hadn't managed to botch the client meeting again, dot the quiet of my workspace was interrupted by a familiar ringtone. Sweet child of mine, the tune my 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, had insisted on programming as her special tone. She should have been enjoying spring break at our Lake Tahoe vacation house with her mom, Miriam, and her younger brother, Tony. Carrie? What's going on, sweetheart? I asked, noting the tremble in her voice. I could feel my body tense as I waited. Daddy, I saw something, something awful, she stammered, her breath hitching. Mommy is with Uncle Rick, and they're, they're saying terrible things about you. The pencil in my hand snapped. What do you mean she's with Uncle Rick? Carrie hesitated. They're saying awful things and doing things I shouldn't see. She lowered her voice. I recorded it. I'm sending it to you. For a moment, I just sat there, frozen. Carrie, where are you right now? I managed to ask, my voice low. In my bedroom. Tony's in his room, too. Mommy thinks we're playing games online. Stay there. Don't let them know you've contacted me. I kept my voice steady, though anger built like wildfire beneath the surface. Are you and Tony safe? Yes, she said, her voice wavering. But, Daddy, it's really bad. The things they're saying about you. I know, honey. I'm going to watch what you sent me. Call me immediately if anything changes. I love you, Carrie. Love you, too, Daddy. The video came through almost immediately. My fingers trembled as I hit play, and there they were. Miriam, my wife of 15 years, wrapped in Rick's arms. They were in the great room of our Lake Tahoe vacation house, the one I had designed myself with its sweeping views of the lake. I'd crafted it for moments with my family, for memories with my children, not for this dot. My chest tightened as I listened to Miriam's voice dripping with contempt. Chauncey is so predictable, she sneered, lounging on the leather sofa I'd bought for her as an anniversary gift the previous year. Always at the office, always with his precious projects. He makes it so easy. Rick's laugh echoed through the speakers. The great architect, too busy building other people's dreams to notice his own house crumbling, he said with an easy confidence. The kids barely see him anymore. Miriam leaned back, looking relaxed and careless her hand resting on Rick's chest. The courts love giving custody to the primary caregiver, and once we have control of the firm, Rick's hands roamed over her possessively. His clients already prefer working with me. They find him too intense. I felt as though the floor beneath me was collapsing. These weren't just lovers stealing time. They were plotting to take everything from me, my kids, my firm, my life. My pulse thundered in my ears as I forced myself to keep watching. This wasn't just an affair. This was a calculated betrayal, a planned dismantling of my life, Dot. Then my phone buzzed again, a message from Tony, my 11-year-old son. His message was short. Dad, check your email. My laptop caught more stuff. He'd attached multiple video files, taken from his gaming laptop set up in the living room for better Wi-Fi. Apparently, it also had a clear view of the room where Miriam and Rick were sharing wine and schemes. I opened the new videos and watched, feeling my anger morph into something sharper, colder. In one clip, Rick was holding a wine glass, gesturing grandly. The firm's weak spot is the international contracts, he was saying. If we time it right, we can force a sale before Chauncey realizes what's happening. Miriam, her eyes gleaming, nodded. My lawyer says that with his work schedule, I can get limited custody. No judge will want to raise children with a dad who works 60-hour weeks. Then another file from Tony appeared in my inbox. He'd found more, screenshots from Miriam's phone that showed every deleted message, altered schedule, and missed event. It was as though every day over the past several months, she'd slowly and methodically erased me from our children's lives. Deleted reminders for Tony's baseball games, modified dates for parent-teacher meetings, She'd even been telling the kids I was too busy to attend family events that I'd never known about, Dot. The doorbell chimed, jolting me from my shock. 
Looking through the window, I saw Elsa Barnes, Rick's wife, stepping out of her car, her usually perfect appearance showing signs of haste and frustration. Elsa was one of the state's top family law attorneys, known for her relentless pursuit of justice, and apparently Carrie had gotten in touch with her. I opened the door, struggling to keep my expression calm. Elsa didn't waste a second, stepping inside with a stack of documents in her arms. Your daughter is resourceful, she said, placing the documents on my desk with a controlled urgency. She found my number in your emergency contacts and called me. How long have you known? I asked, leading her toward the office. About the affair? Three weeks? Elsa's voice was professional, but I could see the strain in her eyes. But their plan to ruin you? That's what brought me here tonight. The kid's evidence was the final piece I needed. She spread the documents across my desk. Bank statements, business contracts, legal filings, all waiting for signatures with initials that looked suspiciously like mine. The depth of their plotting was staggering. They've been thorough, Elsa said, her professional mask slipping for a moment, revealing her anger. Rick's been undermining you at the firm for months, and Miriam's been alienating you from your kids. It's more than an affair, it's a calculated plan. She took a breath, a cold smile playing at the edges of her mouth. And I've been building a case. Rick's arrogance finally caught up to him, and thanks to your children, I have everything I need. I looked at the pile of evidence before me and then at Elsa. I couldn't understand why she would help me, why she wouldn't take this opportunity to ruin Rick on her own. Why are you doing this? I asked quietly, dot. She looked at me, her jaw set in steely determination. Because our spouses didn't just betray us, they tried to destroy us. Her eyes met mine. They plotted to take your children, my career, and both of our financial futures. That deserves a response they'll never forget. The words hung in the air, heavy and final. Elsa turned to the documents on my desk, methodically organizing them into actionable steps. The children are the priority she said, her voice now all business. Everything else is collateral. My phone buzzed again, a message from Carrie. Daddy, Mom, and Rick just left for dinner. Tony's got everything documented. I managed a wry smile despite the turmoil churning inside me. My kids are efficient conspirators. They're survivors, Elsa corrected, her expression softening. They've watched their mother try to destroy their father without realizing it, and they've seen through her lies. I looked down at one of the financial documents in front of me. How much time do we have? She didn't hesitate. Based on their plans, a month at most, Rick's been liquidating assets. Miriam's been researching new schools out of state. We need to act before they realize the kids have chosen sides. Another message flashed from Tony. Dad, Mom left her tablet open. I'm recording their plans, Dot. My mind clicked into action, piecing together the battle plan. I'd trusted Miriam with my heart and Rick with my work. Now they'd left me with nothing but the drive to protect my kids. I glanced over at Elsa, feeling the same cold resolve reflected in her expression. We start now, I said. My voice steady, Dot Elsa nodded, and together we began to organize our response, knowing that every second brought us closer to unveiling the betrayal and reclaiming what was rightfully ours, Dot. The night closed in around us as Elsa and I finalized our strategy. My hands were steady as I flipped through the documents she'd brought. I was feeling the strange calm that comes when a decision is finally made. I'd spent too long in shock, in disbelief. Now it was time for action. Elsa was unstoppable, detailing every step as though she'd been planning this for months. She might as well have. While Rick was busy getting comfortable with Miriam, Elsa was collecting proof. She'd known he was underhanded in business, but only recently had she realized how much he'd worked against me personally. Until Carrie's call pushed her to take the next steps, Dot. The steady buzz of my phone brought us back to the present. Another update from Carrie. Mom and Rick are having dinner at La Provence. They're laughing a lot, acting like it's some romantic getaway, Dot. Elsa looked up from her tablet, her eyes narrowed. La Provence. They think they're untouchable. We're about to change that. I pushed a file across the desk. These papers locked down the firm's assets? Elsa nodded. I filed the preliminary court orders. Until we're in court, you have complete control over company assets, accounts, and contracts. Rick's going to get a very rude awakening. Then, as if on cue, another message came from Tony. 
Uncle Rick's phone was unlocked, got screenshots of his emails. He'd included one, a photo of Rick's inbox, revealing just how deeply he'd involved himself in my projects. Client meetings set up without my knowledge, proposal details edited, even my own designs altered to match his preferences. It was sabotage, plain and simple. Rick wasn't just stealing my wife and children, he was trying to ruin me in every way possible. Elsa's jaw clenched. These emails alone are grounds for a suit, she said. They prove he's been undermining your work. With Tony's recordings, we can show exactly how they plotted to take over your life. I stared at the screen, feeling the familiar ache of betrayal, sharper now than ever. Every moment of support I thought I had from my wife was a lie. Every hand on my shoulder from Rick was a calculated scheme, and they'd underestimated everyone, especially my children. I pulled up Carrie's text again. Tony and I found another hidden chat between Mom and Rick, planning a new account transfer tomorrow. Sounds like they're liquidating accounts. I handed the phone to Elsa, whose eyes hardened. They've been at this for months, but they got careless. She slid my phone back to me and nodded, her resolve unshaken. Let's make them regret it. Elsa worked tirelessly. By midnight, we had protections in place for all major firm assets, and Hassan, my head of security, had contacted me with confirmation that the accounts we'd flagged were effectively frozen. It was strangely fitting. Rick and Miriam were out to dinner, unaware that everything they'd been carefully constructing was beginning to collapse. I left Elsa in the office and walked to the kitchen for a moment alone. Standing by the sink, I looked out the window into the darkness, wondering how I could have missed it. Miriam and I had been married for 15 years. She'd been my anchor, the person who helped me build my career, my family, my life. Now she'd thrown all of that away for, what, a fresh start? My phone buzzed again and I was almost afraid to look, Dot. It was Carrie, mom's laughing with Rick, talking about how she'll get custody. She says the courts are sick of workaholic fathers, that she'll make you out to be some kind of absentee dad. A spike of anger shot through me and I dialed Carrie. She picked up almost immediately. Carrie, honey, are you all right? Yes, dad, but I just can't believe mom would say these things about you. She's acting like she's the only parent who cares about us. I could hear the hurt in her voice, and it felt like a knife to the heart. I'm so sorry you had to hear that, I said quietly, clenching my fist as I spoke. I know this is hard, but I promise I won't let her keep doing this to you or Tony. I love you both more than anything. We know, Daddy, she said, her voice soft but determined. That's why we're helping. I felt a pang of pride mixed with sorrow. My children had been forced into a world they didn't deserve, but they'd stepped up to defend the truth. I'll call again soon, stay safe, and remember that I'm always here for you. I know. I love you, Dad. She hung up, and I felt a swell of emotion that almost brought me to my knees, Dot. The next morning, Elsa and I reconvened in my office, going over every possible angle. Hassan called with an update, confirming that he'd changed the security protocols on all firm systems restricting Rick's access to only public areas. Any account connected to the company now had additional security monitoring in place. I'll be heading to the office shortly, I told Elsa as I reached for my keys. If I don't face him in person soon, he's going to suspect something's off. Good idea, she agreed, stacking documents into a folder. I'll be on standby with the attorney if anything escalates. My phone chimed as I stepped toward the door. It was Tony. Dad, you'll want to see this. He'd sent a video clip taken from the house camera. It was Rick and Miriam in the vacation house kitchen, their heads close together as they whispered about their future. Once the divorce starts, Chauncey will be too busy fighting for the firm to focus on custody, Miriam said, leaning against the counter with an air of satisfaction. He'll probably thank me for taking the kids off his hands. Rick chuckled, pouring himself a glass of wine. And Elsa? Please, Miriam smirked. Once we're done, she'll be lucky to keep her law license. Unbelievable, I muttered, tightening my grip on the phone. They had no idea that Elsa and I had already anticipated their every move, nor did they know that their betrayal had sparked a fire that would destroy them. Dot Elsa glanced at the video over my shoulder, her gaze icy. Ready to make your move? Yes. I said, feeling a new sense of resolve. It's time we put this into action.
I arrived at the firm just as Rick was heading out for a coffee run. He shot me a smug grin and raised his cup as he passed me, the same easy confidence I used to trust so completely. I clenched my jaw, struggling to keep my composure. I had to remind myself that this moment, this small interaction, was nothing compared to what he was about to face dot inside my office. I checked the security logs. Rick's activity was all over the place. Emails, hidden accounts, secret projects. It was clear he'd been working relentlessly to transfer assets, set up backup plans, and pull clients away from me. Dot the knock on my door signaled Elsa's arrival. She entered with a curt nod, her expression serious. All paperwork has been filed. We have the court date set for the custody hearing and the asset protection order. Now it's just a matter of time. I gave her a firm nod. Let's keep him in the dark until the very last moment. The rest of the day passed in tense silence. Rick spent most of his time in the conference room on calls, probably thinking he was negotiating his future. Meanwhile, I was finalizing my plans to protect mine. By evening, the firm's legal team had everything in place for a transition that would leave Rick without access to any of the accounts he'd been siphoning from dot the next morning. I returned home briefly to gather some documents, and as I walked through the front door, my phone buzzed again. Carrie's message appeared, filling me with a new wave of anger. Mom told her friends she'll be moving into the Tokyo penthouse once the divorce is done. She's already planning her life without you, dot Elsa Kama, who had come with me to handle the security details, read over my shoulder. The Tokyo property is part of the firm's holdings, isn't it? Absolutely, I replied. It's an asset held in trust for international clients. No personal use is allowed without board approval. Rick knows this. He helped draft the policy. Then that's our leverage, Elsa replied her smile tinged with satisfaction. One more strike against them. The next few days passed in a whirlwind of preparation. Hassan called me with updates, confirming that all security measures were fully activated. My children continued to send recordings and documents, capturing every moment that would help secure our case, dot on Thursday night, while Rick and Miriam had another dinner meeting. Elsa and I sat in my office, reviewing the evidence Tony and Carrie had collected. Each piece of information built a clearer picture of just how much Miriam and Rick had orchestrated. By now, our response was unstoppable. Dot, finally, comma, the night arrived. Rick and Miriam were completely oblivious to the fact that everything they'd built on lies was crumbling beneath them. Tomorrow, they'd find that the firm had new security protocols, that they'd lost access to accounts, that every plan they'd made was documented and ready to be used in court dot and comma with a little help from my children, I'd make sure they'd never see it coming dot. The morning came quietly, with a deceptive calm that belied what was about to happen. I'd been awake for hours, watching the clock tick down, waiting for the exact moment I could make the first official move. By now, every piece of evidence Elsa and I had gathered was ready, filed with both the courts and our firm's legal team, Dot. As dawn broke, I received a message from Carrie. Mom and Rick just left to go hiking. I'll keep you posted. I replied with a quick thank you and put my phone back in my pocket, feeling the steady pulse of adrenaline. Dot Elsa arrived shortly after sunrise, looking as fierce as ever. She set her briefcase down on my desk and took a seat, wasting no time. We have a window of about five hours, she said, glancing at her watch. They won't be back until at least noon. It's the perfect time to make our move. I nodded, taking in a deep breath. Today, we were going to lay it all on the table. I stood up and called Hassan, who confirmed that all security protocols at the firm had been updated. He had his team set up in strategic positions, ready to prevent any attempt by Rick to retaliate. Let's head to the office, I said, grabbing my keys. I could feel the resolve settling in. This was the moment everything would change. Dot. The office was quieter than usual when we arrived. Elsa and I walked through the lobby, where only a few employees were milling around, glancing our way with curiosity. Most of them had no idea what was about to happen. I made my way to my office and shut the door, reviewing a few final details. Dot just then, my assistant knocked. Mr. Cervantes, Rick is in the conference room with the client from Klein International. He requested that you join them to finalize some details. Perfect. My first chance to face him directly. I turned to Elsa, who nodded, silently affirming our strategy. We'd planned it all out, 
a meeting with Rick, where we would lay out every piece of evidence in front of him, ensuring that there would be no denials, no cover-ups, and the client would be a witness. I walked into the conference room, keeping my expression neutral. Rick looked up and gave me his usual overly confident grin, gesturing for me to join them at the table. Chauncey, great timing. We were just about to finalize the Klein contract. I nodded, sitting across from him, watching as he tried to charm the client. But my mind was elsewhere, already counting down to the moment I'd expose him. Before we move forward, I said, keeping my voice calm, I think we need to go over a few things. Rick glanced at me, a flicker of surprise in his eyes. Now, the details are all squared away. Oh, I think you'll want to hear this, I replied, pulling out a document from my briefcase and sliding it across the table, dot. Rick looked down, his smug grin faltering slightly as he read. What is this? The court order, I said, blocking your access to any firm accounts, properties, or assets. As of this morning, all company funds are under secure management. I watched as Rick's face turned ashen, his gaze darting from the paper to me. For a moment, he looked like he was going to protest, but I continued, pushing another set of documents across the table. And these emails, I said, my voice laced with steel, show your unauthorized edits on project proposals, altered figures, and unauthorized communications with my clients. The Klein client looked on, eyes widening as they processed the extent of Rick's interference. I could see Rick beginning to panic his composure slipping. Chauncey, I... I can explain this, he stammered, reaching for a denial, but I cut him off. Explain, I repeated, voice calm. Explain how you've been sabotaging my work, working with my wife to alienate my children, manipulating financial records, and attempting to take over the firm. The words hung heavy in the air. I had finally said it. I'd confronted him, and there was no way for him to dodge the truth. Rick's face contorted with frustration and fear. You can't prove any of this, he spat, trying to regain his confidence. Oh, I can, Elsa's voice rang out as she stepped into the room, carrying the files we'd carefully compiled. We have documentation of every action you took to undermine Chauncey, not to mention video evidence from his children, and we'll be presenting all of it in court. The Klein client stood up, casting a horrified glance at Rick. This is outrageous, Mr. Cervantes. I'm sorry you had to deal with this. I had no idea this kind of dishonesty was going on. They exited, leaving Rick standing alone across the table from me. He looked furious, but I could see the fear in his eyes. His once confident posture had crumbled, replaced with barely contained panic. What? What are you going to do? He asked, his voice low and desperate. First, I said, leaning forward, I'm taking back everything you tried to steal. The firm is secure, my children are safe and every one of your underhanded actions has been documented. You will no longer have a place here. I left the conference room feeling a surge of satisfaction. I'd confronted him, and now he had nothing left dot. The next few hours were a whirlwind of activity. I'd arranged for a meeting with the firm's board members, briefing them on Rick's misconduct. They were appalled, and after hearing everything, they were more than ready to back me up. By the end of the meeting, the decision was unanimous. Rick was officially removed from the firm dot afterward comma. I took a moment to check my phone, where Tony had sent me a quick message. Uncle Rick's really mad. He and Mom are talking in the car about moving up their plan. The pieces were finally falling into place. Miriam and Rick had underestimated me, underestimated Elsa, and worst of all, they had underestimated my children. I replied to Tony, telling him to stay safe and keep documenting everything. Elsa and I had already made sure that both Carrie and Tony would have full protection through my security team, and I would keep them safe no matter what dot. When I returned to my office, Elsa was waiting, a satisfied gleam in her eye. It's done, she said, holding up the final court filings. Rick has been stripped of all access, and we have every legal document ready for the custody hearing. We're just waiting for the court date. I nodded, my sense of relief tempered by a simmering anger. Miriam had not only betrayed me, but had involved my children in her schemes. Now she'd have to face the consequences of her actions. Dot. My phone buzzed again, this time a message from Carrie. Mom just found out about Rick's job. She's really upset, Dad. Tony recorded the whole thing. 
I read the text, feeling a strange sense of satisfaction. Finally, Miriam would see what her betrayal had cost her. It was the beginning of the end, and I was ready for whatever came next dot. Later that evening, I sat with Elsa in my office, going over the final strategy for the upcoming court case. Every piece of evidence was organized. Every legal protection was in place. My children had risked everything to help me, and I was determined to fight for them. Dot. Then came another message from Carrie. Mom says she's going to make sure you pay for what you did to Rick. I let out a humorless chuckle, showing Elsa the message. Let her try, Elsa said, a cold gleam in her eyes. By the time this is over, she'll be left with nothing but the consequences of her own actions. As the evening wore on, I felt a sense of peace settling over me. My life had been upended, my family shattered, but I wasn't defeated. I'd built my life on a foundation of integrity, and now, with Elsa's help, I was rebuilding it. Stronger, more secure, and free of deceit, Dot Rick and Miriam had made a mistake thinking they could take everything from me. And now, they would pay the price, Dot. By the next morning, the fallout from Rick's dismissal had started to ripple through the firm. Clients were calling in, questioning what they had heard, curious to know if the rumors about Rick's misconduct were true. The board had decided to go public with a carefully worded statement about his removal due to breaches in ethics, and with Elsa's help, we had a full media response strategy in place. Dot. Then came the email from Rick himself. Short, clipped and filled with veiled threats about his legal rights and lost opportunities. He demanded a private meeting, insisting we could find a way to resolve things if we acted in each other's best interests. I didn't bother to reply. By now, he knew he was backed into a corner. Elsa had already filed the firm's lawsuit against him for misappropriation and breach of fiduciary duty, and there was no way he could wriggle out of the evidence we'd compiled dot then comma just after noon, Carrie called me. Dad, Mom's furious, she said, her voice hushed. She's yelling at Uncle Rick, saying everything was supposed to be under control by now. What's she saying? I asked, keeping my voice calm for her sake. She's blaming him for... for everything. She thinks he messed up the plan. Tony's recording it all on his laptop. Good. Stay out of sight, both of you, I said, the warmth in my voice masking the cold fury I felt inside. You're both doing great. I'm proud of you. Thanks, Dad, she said softly. I just want this to be over. So do I, sweetheart. Soon. In the afternoon, Elsa and I made our way to the courthouse to prepare for the custody hearing. We were armed with every piece of evidence we'd gathered, from the altered calendars to Miriam's own words recorded by Carrie and Tony. As we entered, Elsa's presence beside me was a comfort. She was as committed to our case as I was, her expression as unyielding as her resolve. Miriam arrived about fifteen minutes later, looking every bit the part of the wronged woman. Her eyes red-rimmed, her face carefully arranged in an expression of sorrow. She'd always had a way with appearances, using her charm to sway people to her side, to make them believe her version of events. But that wasn't going to work here, Dot. When she saw me and Elsa, her expression faltered, but she recovered quickly, offering a short nod before turning away. Rick wasn't with her. I wondered if she'd finally realized that he was as unreliable as he was deceptive Dot the hearing started, and our attorney opened with the evidence. The documented examples of Miriam manipulating family schedules, the missed events that she had conveniently failed to inform me about, and the emails and messages where she'd discussed using my work commitments to prove I was an absentee father. The judge's expression hardened as each piece of evidence was presented, and Miriam's carefully crafted expression slipped. Dot. When it was her turn to respond, she tried to play the part of a misunderstood spouse claiming that she only wanted what was best for the kids. But her answers grew shorter and more clipped with each question, and the more she tried to defend herself, the clearer it became that her intentions were far from selfless, dot then comma in a twist that not even she could have anticipated, Elsa played one of the recordings Tony had taken on his gaming laptop. It was a short clip of Miriam and Rick, laughing over how easy it would be to paint Chauncey as the bad guy with Miriam boasting about her plans to reclaim her life once she had control of everything dot. As the recording ended, the silence in the courtroom was heavy. Miriam's expression twisted from shock to anger, but the damage was done. 
Her carefully constructed facade was crumbling and everyone in the room could see it dot. After the hearing, I stepped outside with Elsa, feeling a sense of calm. The judge had reserved his decision, but with everything we'd presented, it was clear we had a strong case. Miriam was left with nothing but her anger and her dwindling options dot. When we got back to the office, my phone lit up with a message from Tony. Mom is really upset. She keeps pacing and talking to herself. She keeps saying she'll make sure you pay for this. I replied with a quick thanks for the update. You're doing great, Tony. Knowing my kids were watching all of this unfold, understanding who their mother truly was, filled me with a strange sense of sorrow. But I also felt pride. Pride that they'd stood by me, that they were strong enough to see the truth. Dot later that evening, Elsa and I reviewed our plans for the next stage. The firm was safe, the children were secured with me, and Miriam's attempts to gain custody had been completely undercut. But she was still out there, scheming with whatever means she had left. And I knew better than to think she'd give up quietly, Dot, just as we were wrapping up. My phone buzzed with another message from Tony. Mom just said she's going to ruin you for good. She's going to the vacation house with Uncle Rick tonight. Carrie and I overheard them talking about one last plan. Elsa raised an eyebrow as I showed her the message. They're making this too easy, she said, a cold gleam in her eyes. I nodded, feeling a newfound resolve harden within me. It was time to end this. Then let's prepare for the final phase. By the time we reached the Lake Tahoe vacation house, it was already dark. We parked quietly, keeping a safe distance. Hassan's team had been monitoring the house since earlier that afternoon, so we had a clear view of the property and knew exactly where Miriam and Rick were. They'd brought wine, the same wine they'd used to toast their plans in previous recordings, as if celebrating in my home, Dot. We waited, watching from the edge of the property, listening to the audio feed through Hassan's setup. Rick was pacing around, his voice a low murmur. I can't believe he'd actually kick me out of the firm. I gave him years of my life. Miriam's voice was sharp. He's a fool. Once he realizes he's lost everything, he'll be crawling back. We'll find a way. But the desperation in her voice betrayed her, a crack in her confidence that she couldn't hide dot with everything in place. Elsa and I finally stepped onto the property. I walked up to the door and knocked, waiting as the murmuring inside fell silent. Moments later, Miriam opened the door, her eyes widening in shock. Chauncey, she said, recovering quickly and forcing a smile. This is unexpected. I didn't waste any time. We need to talk, I said, keeping my tone steady as Elsa stood beside me. I stepped into the room, seeing Rick standing by the fireplace, glaring at me with thinly veiled hatred. Miriam's attempt at control faltered as she realized there was no charm or manipulation left to hide behind. This is private property, she said, her voice trembling. Not for you, Elsa replied coldly. This is Chauncey's property, and you have no legal right to be here. Rick stepped forward, his expression twisting into a sneer. You think you can just walk in here and act like you're in control? I held my ground, the anger I'd held back for so long finally rising. I don't think... I know. This is my home, my life, and neither of you has any place in it. Miriam's face twisted with desperation. Chauncey, we can work this out. We have a life together, a family. You don't want to throw it all away? No, Miriam, you threw it all away, I replied, feeling the weight of the truth settle over us. You lied, manipulated, and betrayed me. And the only reason you're here now is because you think you can still gain something from it. But it's over. For a moment, Miriam looked like she was going to argue. But then her expression hardened. You'll regret this, she said, her voice a cold whisper. Not as much as you will, Elsa replied, her voice like ice dot. With a final glare, Rick and Miriam left, slamming the door behind them. I watched them go, feeling a sense of finality wash over me. For the first time in months, I felt truly free, as though a weight I hadn't even realized I was carrying had finally lifted Dot. As Elsa and I locked up the vacation house, I knew that the worst was behind me. I had my children, I had my firm, and I had the truth on my side. 
Rick and Miriam had lost everything they'd tried to take, and I could finally begin to rebuild, knowing that this time it would be on a foundation of strength and integrity. When we left Lake Tahoe, Elsa looked at me with a satisfied smile. You know, they thought they could destroy you, she said, but they didn't realize you'd see through them in the end. I nodded, a quiet resolve filling me. They underestimated all of us, I replied, thinking of my children, of Elsa and of everything we'd managed to overcome. But I'm done looking back. From here on, it's only forward. As we drove away, I knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, I was ready. I had built my life once before, and this time, I would build it even stronger. And as the lights of Lake Tahoe faded behind us, I felt a peace I hadn't known in years. The weeks following that night at the Lake Tahoe house marked the beginning of a new chapter for me and my kids. In the days after Miriam and Rick had been forced to leave, I'd made it clear that my children were my priority, and they were officially living with me full time. It was a relief, finally having Carrie and Tony close, knowing they felt safe and that they knew the truth. Dot Elsa had been a constant presence, helping finalize every legal aspect. She'd come over frequently, especially during the first few days, checking in on me, Carrie, and Tony. My kids were warming up to her quickly sensing her genuine care and unwavering support in helping me shield them from their mother's manipulation. The three of us were finally settling into a routine, building our life back up one piece at a time. One evening, Carrie came into my office at home while I was finishing up some work. She hesitated in the doorway, holding a notebook close to her chest. Come in, sweetheart, I said, motioning her over. She'd grown up so much over the past few months. Her eyes were wiser, more thoughtful than any young teenager's should have been. I hated that she'd been forced to face such painful truths, but I knew she'd come out stronger because of it. Dad, I just wanted to say, thanks, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I set my papers aside, focusing entirely on her. For what? For listening to us. For believing us when we told you everything that was going on with Mom. She looked down fidgeting with the edges of her notebook. I know it wasn't easy, but you listened, and you never made us feel like it was our fault. Tony and I, we're really grateful. I felt a lump form in my throat. I reached out and pulled her into a hug, letting her feel the strength of my love and gratitude. You and Tony are my world, Carrie. I'll always be here for you, no matter what. She hugged me back tightly, and for the first time in a long while, I felt the weight of everything start to lift. My children and I were finally on stable ground. Meanwhile, comma, Miriam and Rick's lives were unraveling rapidly. Rick had attempted to save face with a few clients after his dismissal, but the firm's public statement had been effective. Word quickly spread through the industry, and no one wanted to be associated with someone who'd betrayed his own business partner. Within a week, his entire client roster had dropped him. Financial ruin was imminent for him, and he'd been left scrambling to hold on to what little remained of his reputation. Miriam wasn't faring much better. With limited funds at her disposal and her social circle shrinking as people learned the details of her betrayal, she was beginning to face the reality of her choices. Carrie and Tony no longer answered her calls or texts, and as per the court order, she was restricted to supervised visits only. But even then, my children had made it clear they weren't ready to see her dot one afternoon. Tony came into my office, holding his phone out to me. Dad, Mom left me a message. I think you should hear it. I took the phone, a bit surprised that she'd contacted him directly. I hit play, and Miriam's voice crackled through the speaker. Her tone was filled with frustration, and though she attempted to mask it, I could hear the anger seething underneath. Tony, I don't know what lies your father has been feeding you, but I want you to know that everything I did was for you and Carrie. I was trying to protect you from his workaholic lifestyle. I wanted you both to have a real family. Please don't let him poison you against me. I looked up, meeting Tony's gaze. His expression was unreadable, but I could sense the hurt and anger simmering beneath the surface. What do you want to do? I asked him gently giving him the space to decide how he wanted to handle this dot. He shrugged, his face hardening. Delete it. I don't need to hear that stuff. She never protected us from anything. She only protected herself. I put a hand on his shoulder, feeling a surge of pride. He was growing up fast, 
facing his mother's manipulations with a maturity that astounded me. Good choice. You don't have to let her words define anything about who you are. He nodded, relief crossing his face. As he walked back to his room, I realized how much our lives had changed in such a short time. Carrie and Tony were no longer under Miriam's thumb, no longer torn between divided loyalties. They had found their own voices, and I was here to support them every step of the way. A few weeks later, Elsa stopped by the house with some paperwork, and the kids invited her to stay for dinner. By now, she was more than just my attorney. She'd become a close friend, someone who had been through the fire alongside us. At the dinner table, Carrie and Tony animatedly shared stories about their latest school projects, their laughter filling the house with warmth I hadn't felt in months. Elsa listened with genuine interest, her smile lighting up the room. Watching them interact, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude that someone like Elsa had been there for us through this ordeal dot. As dinner wrapped up, Elsa glanced at me, a thoughtful look in her eyes. Chauncey, I've been wanting to discuss the Foundation for Family Justice, she said, lowering her voice so the kids wouldn't overhear. I think it's time we announce the launch. We had discussed creating the Foundation in the wake of everything that had happened, a resource for parents and children dealing with manipulation and betrayal in family dynamics. Elsa was passionate about the cause, and I had decided to fund it as a way to give back, to help others avoid the kind of pain we'd experienced. I think it's time, I agreed, nodding. If we can help even one family avoid what we went through, it'll be worth it. She smiled, clearly pleased. Then let's set it up. The sooner we start, the sooner we can make a difference. That night, I put Carrie and Tony to bed, feeling a peace settle over me as I watched them sleep. They'd faced so much. Yet here they were, strong and resilient, finding joy in life despite everything. I realized I hadn't lost my family after all. In fact, we were closer now than ever before, Dot. The next day, the announcement about the Foundation for Family Justice went live. Elsa and I organized a press conference where we explained the purpose behind the Foundation, our mission to protect children from parental manipulation, and the importance of supporting parents who were struggling to shield their kids from toxic relationships. As we wrapped up, a reporter raised a hand. Mr. Cervantes, do you have anything you'd like to say directly to families who may be going through similar challenges? I paused, thinking about the journey that had led us here. Yes, I said, my voice steady. To any parent or child facing betrayal, remember that you don't have to face it alone. Seek the support of those who genuinely care about you. Real love doesn't manipulate, it protects, it strengthens, and sometimes rebuilding your life means letting go of those who don't respect you. The applause was quiet but steady, and I knew that finally we were moving forward. In the weeks that followed, life settled into a peaceful routine. Carrie and Tony were thriving at school, and I found myself more engaged in their lives than I had ever been. I was able to attend their events, cheer them on at games, and listen to their stories at the end of each day. It was a world away from the life Miriam had tried to paint for them. Dot, meanwhile, comma, Miriam and Rick's presence faded. The court had ruled definitively on custody, giving me full guardianship of Carrie and Tony and restricting Miriam's contact to supervised visits. Rick's legal battles had intensified, with Elsa handling every detail with the precision and dedication she was known for. Neither Miriam nor Rick would be able to interfere in our lives again. Dot, one evening, as I was tucking Tony in, he looked up at me with a question in his eyes. Dad, do you think people can change, like, Mom? I thought for a moment, choosing my words carefully. People can change, Tony, but they have to want to, and sometimes they have to face the consequences of their actions before they're willing to. He nodded, considering my answer. I hope she does change, he said quietly. But even if she doesn't, I'm glad we're safe here. I hugged him, feeling a mix of pride and sorrow. Me too, buddy. And no matter what happens, we'll always have each other. As I closed his door and walked down the hall, I felt the weight of everything we'd been through, everything we'd lost and everything we'd gained. The betrayal, the pain, and the chaos had brought us here to a place of strength, resilience, and unbreakable love, Dot. 
and as I headed downstairs, I knew that this was only the beginning of a new, better chapter for all of us dot months had passed since the custody ruling, and life had settled into a peaceful rhythm. Carrie and Tony were thriving, each finding their own unique interests and passions. With every passing day, I saw more confidence in them, more assurance that they were in a safe, stable place. The Foundation for Family Justice had gained traction quickly, and I was putting my energy into its development, using the lessons I'd learned through my own experiences to help families dealing with betrayal and manipulation. Dot one afternoon, Carrie came to my office holding an invitation. She had just started high school, and her teachers had encouraged her to apply for a program focused on community leadership. She had been accepted and was eager to use the opportunity to make a difference. Look, Dad! They want me to speak about my experiences with the foundation, she said, her voice filled with excitement. I want to help other kids see that they can get through tough stuff, too. I felt a swell of pride as I looked at her. Carrie had come a long way from the frightened girl who had called me from the Lake Tahoe house. She was resilient, compassionate, and stronger than I could have ever imagined. I hugged her, realizing how proud I was not just of her accomplishments, but of who she was becoming. That's amazing, Carrie. You'll be incredible. Just tell your story and they'll see how strong you are. She smiled, a look of determination in her eyes. I want to show them that no matter what happens, they can be okay, just like us. As she walked out, I felt a deep sense of gratitude. My children had endured so much, and yet they were growing into people of integrity, people who wanted to make a difference. They hadn't let the past define them, and neither would I dot. In the meantime, Tony had started a project of his own. Inspired by everything he'd learned about digital security, he launched a small YouTube channel where he shared tips on protecting personal information and securing online privacy. It was a creative outlet for him, something he could call his own dot one evening. He approached me with his tablet, pulling up his latest video. Dad, I wanted you to see this one, he said, pride lighting up his face. He'd recorded a video about family loyalty and protecting the people you love, speaking directly to his audience with a wisdom far beyond his years. Sometimes things happen that we can't control, he said in the video. But we always have the power to choose who we stand by and what kind of people we want to be. I watched, moved beyond words. Tony was using his experiences to create something meaningful, and I knew he was finding healing in his own way. I'm proud of you, Tony, I said, clapping him on the shoulder. You're going to help a lot of people. He grinned, his cheeks flushing with pride. Thanks, Dad. It feels good to talk about it, you know? I nodded, knowing exactly what he meant. We were all moving forward, finding ways to turn our pain into something valuable. Elsa remained a steady part of our lives, and over time our friendship deepened into something I hadn't expected. She was always there for us whether it was helping with the foundation, offering advice, or just spending time with the kids. Carrie and Tony had grown close to her, and it was clear they trusted her completely. One evening, we were at a foundation event, and I found myself watching Elsa from across the room. She was speaking with a group of parents, passionately explaining our mission and why it was so personal for her. Seeing her dedication, her empathy, and her strength, I felt a warmth that went beyond gratitude. After the event, I walked up to her, still moved by her words. You've changed so many lives, Elsa. I don't think I can ever thank you enough. She smiled, reaching for my hand. Chauncey, you've given me a purpose, too. Working with you and the kids has been one of the most meaningful things I've ever done. I looked at her, feeling a surge of emotion. Over the months, she'd become not only my friend, but someone I could trust. Someone who understood every layer of what I'd been through. We had both been hurt deeply, but together we were building something meaningful, something that helped others rise from the ashes of betrayal and find peace. Dot. With each passing month, the foundation continued to grow. We launched a support network for children affected by parental alienation, providing resources and support that would help them regain their sense of self. Carrie and Tony both contributed to the program, offering their insights and sharing their stories in ways that resonated with other kids. One day, Carrie came home beaming. Dad, a girl from school said she saw my video with the foundation, she said, excitement lighting up her face. 
She told me that it made her feel less alone, that she could relate to my story. I hugged her, filled with pride. That's exactly why we're doing this, Carrie. You're helping others see that they're not alone, and that's something powerful. The Foundation had become a place for all of us to channel our experiences, a place where we could use our pain to make a difference. I felt a renewed sense of purpose, knowing that everything we'd gone through was serving a greater good dot. Meanwhile, common news of Miriam and Rick continued to fade from our lives. Rick's legal troubles had intensified, with multiple lawsuits against him for his actions at the firm. His reputation was effectively ruined, and his once bright future had dimmed under the weight of his choices. Miriam's attempts to regain any control or influence in our lives had been swiftly blocked by the court orders in place, and she was left isolated, grappling with the reality of her own decisions. One afternoon, I received a letter from her in the mail. She had written to ask for forgiveness, pleading with me to allow her back into the children's lives. But as I read through her words, I saw that same manipulation hiding beneath the surface. She wasn't truly sorry. She simply wanted control again. I took a deep breath, feeling a mix of sadness and resolve. I could forgive her in my heart for the sake of my own peace, but I wouldn't allow her to disrupt our lives. Carrie and Tony deserved a future free of lies and manipulation, and I intended to give them just that dot. Without hesitation, I shredded the letter, choosing to leave the past in the past dot one evening, as we were all gathered in the living room, Carrie and Tony snuggled up on either side of me. Elsa joined us with a mug of tea. The air was filled with warmth, laughter, and a sense of togetherness that I hadn't felt in a long time. We were a family, one that had been tested, but was now stronger than ever. Dot Tony looked up at me, his eyes bright. Dad, can we go back to the Lake Tahoe house this summer? I hesitated. Memories of that place filled with both joy and betrayal. But seeing the hope in his eyes, I knew it was time to reclaim that space, to fill it with new memories, free of the shadows of the past. Of course, Tony, I said, ruffling his hair. We'll make it a summer to remember. The kids cheered, already planning out every detail of the trip. Elsa caught my eye, smiling warmly. I knew that we were heading toward a new chapter, one defined not by betrayal or pain, but by love, resilience, and the strength we'd found in each other dot that summer as we returned to the Lake Tahoe house, I saw it with new eyes. I could feel the history there, the echoes of all we'd been through, but those memories no longer held power over me. Instead, they had become the foundation of a life rebuilt, one filled with purpose, truth, and unshakable bonds, dot. The kids ran down to the lake, their laughter carrying through the air, and I felt Elsa's hand slip into mine as we watched them. They're happy, Chauncey, she murmured, her voice filled with warmth. Yes, they are, I replied, feeling a deep sense of peace. We all are. In that moment, I realized that the betrayal we'd endured had not broken us. Instead, it had given us the chance to build something new, something stronger than anything I could have imagined, dot. As the sun set over Lake Tahoe, I knew that our future was brighter than ever and that together we could face whatever came next. Here's the next story. I drank until I couldn't recall and awoke with his best friend. Then he did it. Hey, read it. This is my first time posting on here, so I'm not sure if I'm doing it correctly, but I need a place where I can rant freely and hopefully get some opinions to help me talk to my husband and show him that he's completely wrong here and that he's making a big deal out of something that I think he should just understand and move on from Dot. So let me give you a little backstory so you understand where I am coming from. My name is Veronica, I am 30, and my hubby Jordan is also 30. We've been together for approximately three years, and I believe we've always been a terrific pair. I put a lot of effort into making this relationship fantastic, and I'm the type of person who naturally draws attention, both positive and negative. I realize that some individuals are envious of my life. I mean, my life is practically flawless, so I can't really blame them. I have a solid career, a lovely home, a husband who appreciates me most of the time, and, well, I'm just a unique individual. I'm clever, handsome, and know how to handle any circumstance. Dot, that kind of assurance does not always sit well with others. However, in my opinion, that is their problem rather than mine. Not everyone has things so good, and if that makes people feel threatened, it's their own. 
Jordan and I complement each other perfectly. He's got that consistent, dependable quality going for him. He's always ready to listen. I'm always making sure I'm comfy dot, and he enjoys lavishing me with attention. He'd never say it out loud, but I know he'd do everything to keep me happy. He should have trusted me by now. He understands that I am loyal to him, but his need to be engaged in everything I do may be a little controlling at times. To be really honest, I'm not a fragile doll. I need some space to breathe, to go out and have fun without being questioned or criticized. I'll confess it. I made a small error. However, I believe Jordan can easily overcome this. It's not like I planned anything, and he knew who I was before we met Dot. So, comma, this is what occurred. It was my husband's best friend's birthday celebration. Let us call him Jake. Jake planned to host a celebration at his home, a casual gathering with friends, music, and a lot of booze. You know, fun. Obviously, Jordan and I were present. It's his best friend's party, after all. I was not going to miss it, especially because Jake knows how to have a good time dot. Now, this is where things started to go off track, and I wasn't drinking much at first while Jordan was around, out of respect for him. We've had numerous conversations regarding my drinking recently. He feels I'm overdoing it and continues telling me to cut back. According to him, I'm on a steep slope toward being an alcoholic, which is an exaggeration dot. But he's put a ludicrous amount of pressure on me to be more responsible about it. Sure, I played along while he was present, but Jordan wanted to go early. He wanted to go home while still sober. And I get it. He's not a party animal like me. The boy's idea of fun is a quiet night with Netflix and takeout. I thrive on a good party. I told him I wanted to remain because the party was just getting exciting for me now that we were with friends and Jake was hosting. Jordan thought it was safe for me to stay, so he departed. Jake even assured Jordan that he would drop me off at home or find someone who could if he couldn't quote T. Dot, everything was planned out. Really, there's nothing to worry about. So there I was, finally able to enjoy myself. After Jordan left, I began drinking much more, just unwinding. Really? I will not apologize for having pleasure. It's not something I do every day. I know I screwed up, but you can't really blame me for what occurred afterward. Dot alcohol has the ability to alter the perception of reality. Looser and freer. I wasn't in charge. The beverages were, and I wasn't the only one who drank. Jake was also drinking heavily. As the night progressed, individuals began to leave. Eventually, it was just Jake and myself. Looking back, I see I should have left, but hindsight is 20 20ths, right? I don't remember everything that happened. Honestly, the details are hazy at best. I recall laughing and feeling happy and perhaps flirting with him a little. I mean, Jake has always been easy to talk to, and I will be honest. I've always thought he was very cute. Nothing wrong with a little innocent attraction, right? Apparently, things have escalated dot the next morning. I awoke in his bed next to him, and I'll save you the specifics. But yes, it was evident we had crossed a line. I was shocked, sure, but none of this was in my plan. It wasn't me. It was the drink. Of course, Jordan does not see it that way. He's acting as if I did this on purpose, Dot. As if I intended this to happen, which is just ludicrous. I was shocked when I awoke. Jake was shocked. Sure, it wasn't my fault. Alcohol has a strange effect on people, and I had no intention of sleeping in his bed, but waking up like that was not something I desired or expected. The dawn light made everything feel far too real, and we both sat there in dreadful, mute disbelief, Dot. It was unsettling, to say the least. Awkwardly, I began searching for my clothing, which were thrown on the floor, tugging them on while I attempted to get my bearings. My phone was right beside my trousers, and when I took it up, I noticed the notifications were stacking up. Jordan had messaged me a few times and even attempted calling. I guess he was worried. I looked across at Jake, who was also checking his phone, and of course Jordan had called and texted him. But nobody of us mentioned anything about the obvious. We avoided it like the plague, pretending nothing had happened. When I eventually arrived home, I went straight to Jordan and told him without hesitation that I had had too much to drink, Dot. It was not a falsehood. Technically, I had overdone it. Sure, it wasn't entirely accurate, but it was near enough to make things easy. I knew he'd be unhappy about the drinking alone, and there was no way I was going to tell him what had truly happened. He didn't have to know that. That would just make things a million times worse, Dot, and it's not like I meant to injure him. 
Jordan, of course, was unhappy with the drinking. He went on and on about how he'd been correct all along, and that this was proof I needed to cut back. He began lecturing me about attending alcohol sessions, saying how concerned he is about me, my health, and so on. I apologized, just to make him feel as if I was listening to him. I even informed him he was correct, which he absolutely loves to hear, and that appeared to help him relax a little. Crisis averted. I believed it was the best way to handle things, and it would keep him from digging deeper. Jake and I didn't talk for several days, Dot. We largely avoided one another, as if we had an implicit agreement not to discuss what had transpired. In reality, we hung out as a group with Jordan and Jake, and I kept my calm. We avoided each other's gaze and pretended everything was normal. It was awkward, yes, but we both knew it was better this way. After a few days, I received a message from Jake. He didn't speak much. He simply wanted to make sure we were on the same page. I told him I'd prefer it if he kept this private and didn't say anything to Jordan or anybody else. Jake agreed without hesitation, saying he had no intention of jeopardizing his friendship with Jordan. It was essentially a win-win situation. We didn't want to harm our own life, so staying quiet was the logical solution. And I realize this makes me sound like a bad person, but sometimes self-preservation comes first. I didn't want to jeopardize my marriage over one drunken night that I hadn't even planned. So we chose to keep Jordan in the dark. I honestly believed that would be the end of it. As far as I was concerned, the chapter was closed. We both went on, and I had no plans to revisit it. After a few weeks, I felt a big sense of relief, as if this weight had finally been lifted from my shoulders. It seemed like everything had returned to normal. I began to relax around Jordan again, and I wasn't as worried when he mentioned Jake's name. In fact, I began acting as if nothing had happened, and honestly, it felt very amazing. I'm not saying it was a life-changing experience, but knowing I'd shared this strong, secret connection with Jake gave me a peculiar rush. There was something exciting about possessing this small piece of concealed knowledge that Jordan had no idea about Dot. It even made me feel more alive than I had in years. And honestly, Jordan isn't some saint. I've repeatedly overlooked his flaws, all of his minor faults and instances when he failed as a husband. So, in a strange way, I felt like I was balancing scales. But then Jake began acting like an idiot Dot. At first, he appeared completely committed to keeping things between us, but then he began messaging me at odd hours, throwing clues about catching up or discussing that night. He even hinted at wanting to see me alone, stating we should figure out what this is all about. I mean, figure out what all of this means, as if it has any meaning at all, Dot. And I assumed he was intelligent enough to recognize the situation, that it was a one-time occurrence between us, that we would bury and move on from. But no. Jake apparently had other plans. I reluctantly agreed to Jake's requests, but what choice did I have? I didn't want him to go to Jordan with any of this, so I decided it was easier to keep him happy while keeping the secrets protected, Dot. But I will not lie. Jake's foolishness was graded. I should have known better than to believe he would handle anything like this maturely. First, there was the continuous texting. He seemed to think we were in some type of covert connection. He continued begging to hang out alone or spend another night together, and it was so obvious. It seemed as if he didn't understand that this was not a romantic affair, Dot. It was a one-time accident. However, Jake seemed to have had a different notion. He gradually became more daring, asking me for money here and there with flimsy explanations like being short. This month or I needed a little money for a bill. I went along with it at first, believing that a little money would keep him quiet, which was a minor price to pay, dot besides, comma, he wasn't asking for much, and I expected him to lose interest shortly. And to be honest, my feelings for him had not faded completely. So when he started asking for additional items, I didn't exactly say no. There was still a thrill. The thrill of knowing I was doing something wrong. The thrill of sneaking around, dot plus, comma, I told myself that keeping this all a secret was doing Jordan a favor. Why jeopardize his peace of mind for something he'd never know? What he didn't know would not harm him. And really, I was sparing him the agony of discovering his wife had been with his best friend. So, guilt, pointless. I did not feel anything. I had everything under control. Check it. At first, I assumed Jake would be content with the small things I was doing to make him happy. The cash, the occasional hookup. 
However, as time passed, he continued to push and ask for more, and his demands became more entitled. He acted as if he had authority over me, which I despised. Dot. It was as if Jake believed he possessed me, using that one night as leverage to get whatever he desired. Every request became increasingly ludicrous, and his request began to feel like strange games he was playing rather than favors, as if he was seeing how far he could push me. His entitlement just kept increasing, and really, I'd had enough. I could not bear the thought of him holding something over me like that. I eventually snapped. I told him I was finished. I wasn't going to give him anything more. If he wanted to tell Jordan, he could do so. But I realized I needed to get ahead of this. If anyone was going to break it to Jordan, it would be me. So I sat him down, put on my best remorseful act, and made Jake appear to be the manipulative one. I mean, I wasn't lying. He really had made it impossible. I informed Jordan about the party, the excessive drinking, and how Jake took advantage of the situation. I conveniently omitted the section regarding the favors. Of course, you didn't need to know those things. Jordan was shocked. For a moment, I believe he believed I was joking or playing some strange trick dot. He kept wondering if this was a test to see how he would react, but it was not. And I could tell that when he realized that, something cracked inside him. He glanced at me as if I were someone he did not know. He then requested to see my phone. I was taken off guard, and before I could think of an excuse, I simply handed it over, thinking he would scroll past anything damning dot, but comma. Of course, I hadn't erased Jake's communications, in which he basically laid out what he expected from me. Jordan's demeanor changed from shocked to disgusted. He read every note, and I could see his disappointment morph into outright wrath. He wondered how long I'd been lying, how long I'd allowed Jake ruin our marriage like way dot in. That moment, I realized I had completely lost control of the situation. I reached for my phone, but he yanked it away, almost throwing it at me in disgust. The argument that ensued was brutal. He said things I didn't expect him to say, accused me of betrayal, and refused to accept any excuse I offered. Dot. Then he did something I never imagined he would. He told me to leave. He claimed he couldn't even look at me and needed me out of his sight. He kicked me out of our house, and I was left in complete shock, trying to process that he was doing this. Without anywhere else to go, I went over to Jake's, hoping he'd at least let me crash for the night, but when I arrived, he wouldn't open the door. Jordan had already called him furious, so Jake was back pedaling as fast as he could. He said I was stupid for telling Jordan, and that he had only bluffed when he threatened to tell him dot. So here I am, realizing I ruined my entire life for nothing. I lost Jordan because of this mess, and Jake won't even speak to me. I've been crashing at my parents' house, and they're not thrilled. We've never had the best relationship, and they're clearly disappointed in me. I honestly don't know what to do now. I feel betrayed and totally alone. I know Jordan is overreacting, and he should understand that my coming clean demonstrates how much I cared about him. I was trying to save our relationship by being honest. I believe he is being unreasonable and Jake is at fault here, not me. Update. Hello, Reddit. So, I'll say it right away, Dot. Thank you for nothing. I didn't come here expecting flowers and applause, but I did hope to get some advice. I mean, a few helpful hints on what to do next, how to deal with Jordan, or perhaps just a little support. But nope. All I got was a series of insults. Some of you clearly enjoy the drama and appear to be more interested in shaming me than in helping Dot which is precisely why I shouldn't have bothered with Reddit. It can be the worst form of social media at times. But you know what? Since you all seem so invested in my life and clearly can't look away, I'll keep sharing updates. It's truly good to have a place to vent. So, here goes. First things first. I'm still at my parents' place. Dot. It quote has been awkward to say the least. They're avoiding me as much as possible, and it's painfully obvious they want me out but don't know how to do it. I know they don't want me here any more than I want to be here, but they know I don't have a job, and if they kick me out, I'll be homeless. Even though we don't get along, I think they're at least reluctant to throw me out on the street dot, and even if they did try, I'd probably guilt trip them into letting me stay. I mean, where else am I going to go? I don't have the money to move out or put my things in storage, and I'm certainly not about to toss my stuff in the trash, so here I am, stuck in this awkward limbo. Meanwhile, Jordan is making it crystal clear he's done with me, Dot. And honestly, 
It's getting suspicious. The way he's rushing this whole thing makes me wonder if he's already got someone else lined up. Maybe he's been cheating on me and just wants me out so he can move in his new friend. I mean, I made one mistake. Okay, maybe a little more than one, but still, it was a first for me, Dot. So why is he puffing this up like it's the end of the world? Every discussion we have now is him telling me he's sending his lawyer after me and that any communication should go through them. He's seriously trying all out to push me out of his life as quickly as possible. And it's exhausting. And speaking of exhausting, let's talk about my job. Or rather, my old job. I recently was fired and it came entirely out of nowhere. I'm 80% sure Jordan had anything to do with it. He got me the position in the first place, so it's not a stretch to imagine he'd have enough pull to make sure I lost it. He even hinted at it once on the phone, telling me he'd make sure I paid for cheating on him, dot then comma out of nowhere, I'm abruptly out of employment. It's not like I had much in savings anyway, especially since Jordan depleted our joint account. So now I'm unemployed, broke, and essentially stranded in my parents' house. I'm beginning to question if I have any legal grounds here. Maybe I can sue him if I can find a lawyer who will take the case on contingency dot. It may be worth a shot. Does anyone here know if I have a case? On a slightly more upbeat note, Jake was also fired, according to what I heard. And really, good riddance because he refused to let me stay at his apartment when Jordan kicked me out. I've blocked him from everything, but the fact that he's now unemployed feels like karma dot. He seems to be frightened since he has no savings, so we are both in a mess right now but at least I know he's not doing any better. So, that's my life right now. Let's see if anyone has something helpful to say this time. Update. So, I suppose anything. I've received several direct messages from folks requesting an update, so here it is, dot, unfortunately, comma, things aren't going as smoothly as I expected. First, I went to see a lawyer. As I stated, I would. It turns out I won't be able to sue after all. The lawyer frankly informed me I didn't have much of a case, especially since I don't have any concrete proof or evidence that Jordan attempted to get me fired. I even attempted to beat him by emailing him, hoping he would make a mistake or hint at it in some way, but he remained calm and pretended not to understand what I was saying. So yes, the notion is dead in the water. It's bothersome, but whatever. I will just have to find another job and move on. Speaking of jobs, I've been looking for work, and I can tell you it's been exhausting. I had forgotten how tedious this process is, but I don't really have a choice unless I want to be homeless and broke. My parents, for one, make it abundantly apparent. They basically sat me down and told me that I needed to start paying rent and contribute to the costs. I have my own parents. Can you believe it? They know I'm in a bad situation, but they're asking their own child for rent. I was astonished, but I can't really argue with them because, frankly, I don't have any place else to go. So I agreed but only after I got a job. I have no choice. As if that weren't enough, Jordan's lawyer officially served me. So I think he's truly pushing for the divorce dot great. To be honest, I'm over it. I used to believe I cared, but now I'm not even sure. He's being foolish, and it's entirely his fault we're in this situation. He's so self-righteous, not even attempting to recognize that my acts were not wholly my fault. He is aware of how volatile I can get when there is alcohol involved. Yet here he is, making a big deal out of a single error dot. Looking back, I suppose I should have expected him to be like this. Jordan has always been a pretty insensitive person. He was never very good at placing himself in other people's shoes. So, yeah, I suppose he's simply revealing his true colors. Whatever. I'm done wasting my energy on him. I will put my life back together, with or without his assistance. Update. Hey, it has been a while. I actually forgot about this entire post until I saw my own TikTok tale. There were some extremely unpleasant comments, and of course everyone is blaming me, tearing me down and calling me names. I suppose I expected it, but it still stings. To be honest, I've been so focused on survival that I haven't had much time to think about anything else, Dot. My life hasn't gone as planned, and it's finally dawning on me. I've realized how incorrect I was and how much I contributed to my own failure. The wake-up call came after the divorce was finalized. I didn't receive anything. No spousal support, no financial assistance, nothing. Apparently, I did not qualify because I was able-bodied and had previously worked, and our marriage was not long enough dot. So that was it. Jordan pulled me out of his life completely, like if I didn't matter to him, which startled me. It was a massive slap in the face, and for the first time, I began reaching out, hoping to get through to him. 
I suggested that now that the divorce was finalized, we could start over and rebuild things, Dot. But he has ignored all of my attempts to communicate. I do not know what to do. I finally accepted that this was entirely my responsibility, and Jordan had no involvement. I tossed everything away, and now I'm paying the price by making things worse. I still haven't found a job, Dot, not a single one in months. I can't help but wonder if Jordan has blacklisted me. We work in the same industry, and he is influential. It's a very competitive sector, and finding work without connections is already difficult. So if he blacklisted me, that would explain a lot. Then, my parents kicked me out. They were tired of waiting for me to get my life in order, and I don't blame them, Dot. But now I'm totally on my own. I've couch surfed, been in homeless shelters, and even spent some nights sleeping on the street. I sold everything I could, everything of value, because I couldn't afford to keep it in storage, and I decided I might as well put the money to good use. I even established a GoFundMe campaign, but it didn't gain any traction. People don't seem to want to help anymore. I am literally at rock bottom. Some days I can barely afford to eat, and all I can think about is saving enough money for a cheap automobile so I can at least sleep in it. I never imagined I'd be in a position to consider working for minimum pay, but now I'd be glad for anything dot I quote V been applying to fast food restaurants and every job that comes along, even if it's only enough to get by. Even more difficult to comprehend is that no one sympathizes with me. Not my parents, not my buddies, nobody I know. I did it to myself. But it's still difficult to face this alone. That seems to be my new normal dot. I quote L probably be mocked even more for posting this, but I don't care. I know I've been selfish and made awful decisions, and I'm dealing with the consequences every day. Dot. Thank you for listening to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Also, leave a comment below to share your thoughts on what happened. Take care.